Introduction to the Elegies by Kevin Crossley Holland. Although one speaks of the elegies, this is no more than a label of convenience applied to a small group of poems not unlike each other in theme and tone. So far as we know, the Anglo-Saxons themselves did not give their poems, let alone groups of poems, names at all. It has been said that in Anglo-Saxon poetry, the lyric mood is always the elegiac. There is a lot of truth in this. When the poet bares his breast and sings of his own feelings, either autobiographically or using the mask of a persona, his song has to do with some loss and cause for grief. It is mournful and plangent. And without going so far as to use the pathetic fallacy, the Anglo-Saxon poets let the natural world reflect states of human mind and heart. In Beowulf, for instance, the sense of wonder and fear of the unknown that possessed the old Danish king as he describes the haunt of the two monsters that terrorize his court is caught and extended in this way. These two live in a little-known country, wolf slopes, windswept headlands, perilous paths across the boggy moors where a mountain stream plunges under the mist-covered cliffs, rushes through a fissure. The elegiac mood wells up, then, in a great number of Old English poems. But the six so-called elegies are poems where the topic itself is loss. Loss of a lord, loss of a loved one, the loss of fine buildings fallen into decay. They are all to be found in the Exeter Book, a manuscript now in Exeter Cathedral Library. At the heart of Anglo-Saxon society lay two key relationships. The first was that between a lord and his retainers, one of the hallmarks of any heroic society, which guaranteed the lord military and agricultural service, and guaranteed the retainer protection and land. The second was the relationship, as it is today, between any man and his loved one, and the family surrounding them. So one of the most unfortunate members of this world, as of any, was the exile, the man who, because of his own weakness, cowardice, for example, or through no fault of his own, was sentenced to live out his days wandering from place to place, or anchored in some alien place, far from the comforts of home. This is the situation underlying four of the elegies. Together with Beowulf, the seafarer is probably the best known of all Anglo-Saxon poems, partly because of its translation by Ezra Pound, and it is much more obviously the work of a Christian than the wanderer. In the first part, the seafarer offers a stirring picture of the pull of the sea, the hardship, the magnetism, the self-imposed exile that brings its own rewards, which prosperous men living on the land cannot begin to understand. This culminates in lines charged with a remarkable passion, a deep sense of longing that cannot possibly be ignored, and yet paradoxically can never be satisfied. The seafarer then goes on to equate a life at sea with the renunciation of worldly pleasures and with a life dedicated to God. Once again, the poet is concerned with transience. Landlubbers will see everything perish around them, but the seafarer, for the sea journey is in the end symbolic, is sailing to eternal bliss. The Seafarer, written by an unknown author of Anglo-Saxon heritage, translated by Kevin Crossley Alland. I can sing a true song about myself, tell of my travels, how in days of tribulation I often endured a time of hardship, how I have harbored bitter sorrow in my heart, and often learned that ships are homes of sadness. Wild were the waves, when I often took my turn, the arduous night watch, standing at the prow, while the boat tossed near the rocks. My feet were afflicted by cold, fettered in frost, frozen chains. There I sighed out the sorrows, seething round my heart. A hunger within tore at the mind of the sea-weary man. He who lives most prosperously on land does not understand how I, careworn and cut off from my kinsmen, have as an exile endured a winter on the icy sea. Hung round with icicles, hail showers flew. I heard nothing there but the sea booming, the ice-cold wave, at times the song of the swan. The cry of the gannet was all my gladness, the call of the curlew, 
not the laughter of men, the mewing gull, not the sweetness of mead. There storms beat the rocky cliffs, the icy feathered tern answered them, and often the eagle, dewy-winged, screeched overhead. No protector could console the cheerless heart. Wherefore he who is used to the comforts of life, and, proud and flushed with wine, suffers little hardship living in the city, will scarcely believe how I, weary, have had to make the ocean paths my home. The night shadow grew long. It snowed from the north. Frost fettered the earth. Hail fell on the ground, coldest of grain. But now my blood is stirred, that I should make trial of the mountainous streams, the tossing salt waves. My heart's longing always urge me to undertake a journey, to visit the country of a foreign people far across the sea. On earth there is no man so self-assured, so generous with his gifts, or so bold in his youth, so daring in his deeds, or with such a gracious lord, that he harbors no fears about his seafaring as to what the Lord will ordain for him. He thinks not of the harp, nor of receiving rings, nor of rapture in a woman, nor of worldly joy, nor of anything but the rolling of the waves. The seafarer will always feel longings. The groves burst with blossom, towns become fair, meadows grow green, the world revives. All these things urge the heart of the eager man to set out on a journey, he who means to travel far over the ocean paths. And the cuckoo, too, harbinger of summer, sings in a mournful voice, boding bitter sorrow to the heart. The prosperous man knows not what some men endure who tread the paths of exile to the end of the world. Wherefore my heart leaps within me, my mind roams over the waves, over the whale's domain. It wanders far and wide across the face of the earth, returns again to me, eager and unsatisfied. The solitary bird screams, irresistible, urges to the heart, to the whale's way over the stretch of the seas. So it is that the joys of the Lord inspire me more than this dead life, ephemeral on earth. I have no faith that the splendors of this earth will survive forever. There are three things that, until one occurs, are always uncertain. Illness, or old age, or the sword's edge, can deprive a doomed man of his life. Wherefore each man should strive, before he leaves this world, to win the praise of those living after him, the greatest fame after death, with daring deeds on earth against the malice of the fiends, against the devil, so that the children of men may later honor him, and his fame live afterwards with the angels for ever and ever, in the joy of life eternal amongst the heavenly host. Days of great glory in the kingdom of earth are gone forever. Kings and Kaisars and gold-giving lords are no longer as they were when they wrought deeds of greatest glory and lived in most lordly splendor. This host has perished. Joys have passed away. Weaklings thrive and hold sway in the world, enjoy it through their labors. Dignity is laid low. The earth's flower ages and withers, as now does every man throughout this middle world. Old age comes visiting. His face grows pale, gray-haired. He mourns. He knows his former friends, the sons of princes, have been placed in the earth. Then, when life leaves him, his body cannot taste sweetness or feel the sharpness of pain, lift a hand or ponder in its mind. Though a man may strew a grave with gold, bury his brother amongst the dead with the many treasures he wished to take with him, the gold a man amasses while still alive on earth is no use at all to his soul, full of sins in the face of God's wrath. Great is the fear of God. Through him the world turns. He established the mighty plains, the face of the earth and the sky above. Foolish is he who fears not his Lord. Death catches him unprepared. Blessed is the humble man. Mercy comes to him from heaven. God gave man a soul because he trusts in his strength.